Well, good morning, live stream. Let's start our chapel service today with this song, The Lower Lights.
jump back into Galatians, shall we? All right, y'all, let's go ahead and get started with our Bible study, shall we? Um, we're going to start Galatians chapter 2 today. Um, Galatians 1, just as kind of a recap, uh, Paul um, Paul gives kind of his testimony, his uh, his his br uh, brief stay with uh, with Peter, uh, his his meeting with the apostles. Uh, he implores the people to please do not give up the gospel that I preach to you. Please do not fall for another gospel, and uh, really kind of condemned and cursed those who would preach a different gospel than the gospel of grace. Starting with verse 1 in Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes, 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and I took Titus along, and I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas uh, the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Lord, help us to, as we unpack this, Lord, to, um, to, to pull out exactly what you have for us today. Lord, uh, we celebrate the life of Paul. We pray, Lord, we thank you for uh, for his uh, desire to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, of which we are all beneficiaries. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So in this section, Paul fast-forwarded his, uh, his testimony, passed his, the first missionary journey, and recounted a time when he went to Jerusalem to debate whether Gentiles had to become Jews before they could become Christians. Remember, we discussed that in the first chapter. There were a lot of people who thought that, first of all, you had to become a Jew. Uh, you had to uh, you had to be circumcised, which is a painful uh, a procedure. You had to go through. Uh, you had to obey all the Levitical laws, and, and then and only then could you become a Christian. Uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Luke writes in Acts chapter 15, he says, some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Um, and so Luke would agree that that is a false teaching. Well, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Luke continues, so Paul and Barnabas were uh, appointing along with appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. And so uh, that's Acts 15, uh, first couple of verses. Uh, so this is Paul's account of what occurred. And the issue was settled once and for all that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. And it was a victory of truth. It was a victory for the gospel of grace. Well, in Paul's comments, we learned that there are uh, three very important things. And we're going to discuss today what grace, what God's grace can do. First of all, grace frustrates legalists. Uh, legalists uh, are uh, 
they try to enslave you with all the things you must do. Paul wrote, some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to try to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus to make us slaves. Um, did you know that there were spies in the early church? They weren't 007. They were, they were Pharisees. They, they were double uh, oh so judgmental. They were, they, uh, they infiltrated the ranks of the early church. And we know that uh, Jewish Pharisees gave Jesus a lot of grief during his ministry. They accused Jesus whenever they, uh, whenever they thought he had did something or did, uh, had not done something that was contrary to the law of Moses. Well, Acts 15.5 reveals that some Pharisees who claimed to have become Christians, uh, they were subjecting the Gentile Christians to the same, um, the same uh, scrutiny that they had uh, subjected Jesus to. And they didn't like the fact that these new Christians had so much freedom, so much liberty. And so they wanted to enslave them to legalism. Remember, legalism is the opposite of freedom. It's the opposite of grace. C.J. Mahaney said, has uh, provided this very good definition of legalist, which comes from his book, The Cross-Centered Life, page 25. He says, a legalist is anyone who behaves as if they can earn God's approval and forgiveness through personal performance. And so legalism uh, emphasizes rules over a relationship. It's focusing on Christian standards rather than Christ the Savior. It's about law instead of love. And so the theme of, the, of, of Galatians, the book we're studying, is how grace liberates us and how legalism enslaves us. Late, later uh, in the letter to the Galatians, Paul writes, But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Uh, are you observing special days and months and seasons and years? I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. You see, some of the, the Pharisee slash Christians were demanding that all Christians observe the Jewish feasts, Yom Kippur and, and the Passover. And they demanded that Christians obey the Sabbath day rules and the, their dietary rules, right? In other words, no bacon or ham. Uh, at breakfast, right? Oh, I, I went to McDonald's this morning. I got a, a sausage, egg, and cheese uh, muffin, right? Oh, no sausage, right? No, you can't do those things if you are if you are a, a, a Jew. And so that legalism exists today, uh, but it isn't about keeping Jewish festivals as much as it is thinking that Christians can earn God's love and acceptance by what they do or what they don't do. Uh, a good example is, you remember the Ed Sullivan show, right? You remember the guy that spin all those plates on the little, the poles, the wobbly poles? And as he's spinning these these plates, right? He starts spinning a plate and then he'd spin the, go down to the next one. And and uh, eventually some, some would start to wobble and he'd have to go over and spin them again. And, and it, it just seemed like it was going to end in disaster at any moment. And, you know, he would, he would, sometimes he would ignore a wobbling plate. And so the audience would start screaming and he, he would go over quickly, run over and spin it just in time. Well, that's kind of a picture of legalism. This belief that I can keep all my spiritual plates spinning and I can earn more of God's favor, right? Well, you know, it's an entertaining um, to watch that on television, but uh, that's a terrible way to live, right? Well, I need to keep spinning my tithing plate, or uh, I need to uh, in that missionary support group, and, and and you know, I got I got to have six plates at least. Uh, and if Sunday rolls around and I've kept all these plates spinning, well, I can smile because I know that God is pleased with me. But if a Sunday rolls around and I've let a couple of 
plates fall, um, then, uh, then uh, you know, God isn't quite as pleased. And I'll promise I'll do better next week. That's a terrible way to live, right? Uh, we need to realize that God's love is unconditional and his grace is unconditional. So uh, grace frustrates legalists. It also creates fellowship with like-minded believers. At the meeting in Jerusalem, the issue was, was settled and the result was fellowship. Paul wrote, James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Paul, me and Barnabas, sorry, the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. And so the leaders gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. That just means they shook their hands. So when we greet each other by shaking hands, which we can't do right now, right? But we're actually practicing a biblical custom. Shaking hands was the ancient custom that it grew out of two peaceful soldiers grabbing hands to prove that they didn't have a weapon. Um, someone said when, uh, when the church was born in Jerusalem, it was a fellowship. And when it went to Greece, it became a philosophy. When it went to Rome, it became an institution. And when it went to Europe, it became a culture. And when it went to America, it became an enterprise. How the church needs to return to being a fellowship. I couldn't find out who wrote that quote, but what an amazing quote, right? Uh, this idea that the church has become something that it was never intended to be. It was supposed to be a fellowship. And the Greek word in the New Testament for fellowship is the word koinonia. Uh, it means to have all things in common. The, uh, the common language of the New Testament was called Koine Greek, which had been spread throughout all the parts of the world by Alexander the Great. And so Koine uh, meant it was a common language shared by everyone. And Koinonia is what Christians share in common, which is a faith in Jesus. Uh, here's a quick trivia question for you. What is the largest living organism on the planet? Uh, I mean, the largest si single organism, plant or animal. You might think, well, it's probably a whale, right? A blue whale. Uh, but that's only 200 tons. It's not the largest. You might think, well, what about the massive redwood trees in California? And uh, that's actually not either. Um, the largest one of them is only 2,000 tons. Well, are you giving up yet? The largest organism in the world is a grove of aspen trees in Fish Lake National Forest in Utah. And although they appear to be many trees, genetic tests have proven that all the trunks are, share the same root system. And so the name of the grove is Pando, which is uh, Latin for it spreads. And it is an organism that weighs over 6,000 tons, making it the single, the largest single organism on the earth. Um, and the grove has been burned before, but the trunks may die. But the root, as long as the roots survive, the trunks will, will grow again. Well, actually, there's an organism that's larger than that, right? We call it the church. And uh, we aren't an organization. We are a living organism. We're the body of Christ. And we share the same root system. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who, who is called the root of Jesse in Isaiah uh, 11. There have been many attempts to stamp out the church. But as long as our roots are in Christ Jesus, right? As long as the root of the church is Jesus, the fruit of the church is fellowship. I am a Christian first. Now, I'm a Baptist second, right? But I got a secret to share with you. You ready? You ready? God is doing great things among a lot of people who are outside of your denomination, right? <laughs> Why shouldn't we be fellowshipping with people who are like-minded believers who may not carry the label 
Baptist or Lutheran or Presbyterian, uh, right? And so, um, God, uh, God is working through all different denominations. Um, I say like-minded believers. I want to make sure that we understand there's a couple of non-negotiables there. First of all, Jesus is God. All right. That kind of rules out a few other denominations, a few other so-called denominations. Um, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Um, that is something that is a non-negotiable. Uh, salvation is by grace through faith. And the Bible is the absolute authority for truth. Now, if you believe in all four of those things, you may call yourself Presbyterian, you may call yourself Methodist. Uh, hey, we can worship together. Uh, someone sent me a funny email one time. It says, some time ago, I came upon a fellow who was on the edge of a bridge. He looked as if he was ready to jump. I ran over and grabbed him by the hand to see if I could save him. I said, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? He said, yes. I said, but that started asking him some other questions. I've, I've learned you can't be too careful. Do you believe in the virgin birth? I asked. I accept it. Deity of Jesus, no doubt. Uh, and so I thought, could I be face to face with a fellow believer? Perhaps. So I continued my checklist. Bodily resurrection of Christ. Absolutely. Status of man, sinners, need of grace. The Bible, totally inspired with no error. And I was getting excited. Conservative or liberal? And he was getting excited too. Conservative. My heart began to beat faster. Denomination, he smiled. He said, Southern Congregationalist, Holy Son of God, Dispensational Triune Convention. That was mine too. What branch? Premillennial, non-charismatic, King James, one cup communion. My eyes just missed it over. We had so much in common. And I asked one more question. Is your pulpit wooden or fiberglass? Fiberglass, he responded. I withdrew my hand and walked away. As I said, go with, go ahead and jump, you heretic. <laughs> uh, isn't it funny how we get so caught up over things that really don't matter? Um, During, uh, uh, let me show you one more illustration of this. It's really, really, really neat. During vacation Bible school, there was a new student that showed up one morning, a little boy who had one arm missing. And the teacher was nervous that the children might comment on his handicap, but nobody seemed to notice. Well, at the end of the class, without thinking, the teacher said, now let's put our hands together and make a church. Remember that old, you know, here's the church, here's the steeple. And uh, and as she watched uh, in horror, the one-armed boy raised his right hand and she realized that she had said the wrong thing. But a little girl who was sitting next to the boy, she reached over with her hand and placed it with his hand and said, hey, let's make the church together. We need to make the church together. I thought that was a sweet little story. All right, lastly, grace motivates us to be graceful to those in need. Um, verse 10 says, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. And so Paul left the Jerusalem conf conference with this victory of grace. Uh, they didn't have to require that all Gentiles become circumcised or become Jews, but it did mean uh, that... Um, it did mean that there were responsibilities, right? Uh, uh, there's no rules for you to accept God's free gift of salvation. But Jesus gave us two commands, right? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? With everything that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. There are over 300 verses in the Bible about caring for the poor. And God says, if you spend yourselves in, ha uh, in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of of the oppressed, then your light will rise in darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. You know, you don't have to look very far to find poor people in Arizona. Um, poverty exists um, right where we are, right? 
the these prize Glendale, North Phoenix. Um, and so God isn't asking you to solve the problem of poverty around the world, but he is asking you to be a part of the solution. There's a sign out by my kid's school, which uh, says, please don't give to panhandlers, uh, but rather give to organizations that help them, right? We have to be smart in our solutions, but it is important that we be gracious givers to those who are less fortunate. Um, you know, I, I think to, just to sum this up, Paul says, first of all, that, um, that grace uh, is not about what we do, right? We don't try, it, it, it's not about enslaving others and we have to resist uh, the urge to fall for legalist claims because they seek to enslave us. Um, the second thing that, uh, that Paul says is that grace creates fellowship. Fellowship is so important for a believer. We need each other. And lastly, uh, it motivates us to be graceful to those who are in need. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, for all that you have blessed us with. Lord, I thank you for the writings of Paul. Lord, uh, I would have loved to have been there uh, to, to witness Paul meeting with the other apostles. Um, Lord, for their commissioning him to be the the apostle to the Gentiles. We pray, Father, that we would continue that work, Lord, that we would continue to preach this gospel of grace, Lord, that we, would, we wouldn't fall into the trap of legalism, but Lord, that we would look unto grace as a gift and be grateful for all that you've done for us. We lift up our hands. We praise you for, uh, for your salvation. We give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Love you all. Have a blessed rest of your day.